Well, a very good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, which today we'll turn the spotlight on sepsis and improving clinical conditions and outcomes and the power of uh, new rapid diagnostics. I'm Paul Anthony. I'm the conference producer here at Nolex. And I'm joined today by Ron Daniels, Chief Executive of the UK Sepsis Trust. We've also got with us Shan Anakin. Uh, she's deteriorating at Russell Hall Hospital and hopefully Dr Sandy Estrada who's the clinical pharmacist in infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship. Sandy's also a medical affairs expert and I say hopefully because she's actually based in Florida and obviously there's bad weather over there at the moment. Hopefully we'll get her on uh, before the end of the webinar. If not we've got a, a, a very good replacement in Oscar Guzman and we'll introduce him a little bit later. Very shortly we'll get the webinar underway but before we do that just a bit of housekeeping First, can I please don't share any of the presentation slides on social media and please don't share any screen grabs of the slides either with anybody else. There will be a PDF version of the slides available to download after the webinar is finished and we'll email you directly when that PDF version of the slides are on the website. Uh, during the webinar, you will be able to ask questions by typing them into the chat box, which you'll find on the right hand side of the screen. We will try and answer all the questions during this session, but if we don't manage to do that, then our speakers will answer them by after the webinar. And also the webinar will be recorded. We understand that you do have jobs to do. So for, if for any reason you have to leave before the end and uh, you can watch it again at your leisure from tomorrow onwards, you can even play it out to your colleagues if they've not been able to join us. So let's move on and let's get the webinar underway. First of all, let's bring in Ron Daniels, Chief Executive of the UK Sepsis Trust to get the webinar underway. Good afternoon, Ron. Thank you so much, Paul. Good afternoon and good afternoon to everyone. And I'm conscious that we have a lot of experts in the room, a lot of sepsis nurses and clinical practitioners who are already managing patients with this condition. So I see my job as really presenting an update on the national and international stage from the perspective of sepsis, as well as linking this, as Paul rightly said, to rapid diagnostics. So I'm going to talk about this as a health systems issue. Can I just check that you can see my slides? Yes, we can see. You. Thank you. Now, many of you who've seen me speak before will have seen this slide, but I think it is still impactful. This is, of course, Villa Park, the home of Aston Villa Football Club. And at capacity, Villa Park holds around 43,000 people, which gives us context. Because breast cancer, at least prior to the pandemic, we knew claimed around 11,000 lives every year in the UK. Bowel cancer, rather more, around 16,000. And of course, it's right and proper we continue to improve outcomes from those conditions. But in 2020, the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation, who were the people who write the Global Burden of Disease Report for the WHO, estimated that in the UK, sepsis claims 48,000 lives every year. Now, no one is claiming that every one of those lives lost is preventable. They're not. Neither are we claiming that they're all unique because, of course, these conditions can coexist. People can have a neutropenic sepsis following chemotherapy for breast cancer, for example. But as most of you know, the very basics of care for sepsis remain appropriate even for people who are being palliated for other conditions because we just might be able to return this person home to their loved ones for a valuable number of weeks or months. And again, the IHME report showed that globally, sepsis affects 49 million people every year, claiming 11 million lives. And again, as you know, I like context and comparisons with other conditions. Cancer claims just fewer than 10 million lives around the world every year. I've been slightly disingenuous choosing only ischemic heart disease, which claims around 7 million, because cardiovascular disease remains the biggest killer at around 17 million lives lost worldwide. But this means that sepsis accounts for one in five lives lost around the world every year. And most of you, like me, will know exactly how real COVID-19 is, have been struck hard by it in your organisations. But let's remember that thus far, COVID in two and a half years has claimed six and a half million lives. Sepsis every year claims 11 million lives. I want to dispel a myth, this myth that some of you might have read about in some of the journals saying that sepsis only affects the elderly and the frail. It's nonsense. Of course, you're more likely to develop sepsis if you're over 65 or over 75 compared with a young adult. But that doesn't mean that those are the only people we see. New York State has a population of 20 million people. This was in response to mandated reporting of sepsis. So this was not an insubstantial study. And in 2018, the data showed that almost half of adults developing sepsis in New York State were under 69. So almost half were working age adults. 
Similarly, in children, we hear from the propaganda that sepsis only affects very tiny neonates and, and very poorly children. Well, again, in New York State, more than half of children developing sepsis in 2018 were over six years of age. So let's put to bed this myth that sepsis is only about the old, the frail or the very sick young. And it's these quanta that have prompted international interest. Now, a few years ago, we had the WHO adopt a resolution on sepsis and we're working with them and we met with them this week to really try and reinvigorate that in the post pandemic period. But the G7 ministers have recently placed sepsis in their communique and are now taking it to the G20 summit. So international attention is increasing. When we had that resolution adopted by the WHO, we got the former chief medical officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, to write a forward. And he said some really important clinical issues, many of them a matter of life and death, exist in this backwater inhabited by professionals, academics and enthusiasts. But the public and political space is where this needs to be in order for things to change. Now, we make no apologies as a small charity for using existing marketing and dissemination strategies to get the message out there free of charge. We don't pay for any of this. Now, seven of the 10 English ambulance services are carrying sepsis messaging. We work with sports clubs. This is just one example in Liverpool. Iceland Foods is another great example. They were printing milk bottle labels anyway. So they decided to put sepsis messaging on them. And so far they've sold 100 million milk bottles with sepsis messaging. It cost us nothing, it costs them nothing. And it's getting the word out there. But back to the clinical space. And many of you will be aware that we're in a, a state of transition at the moment. These are tools, at least versions of which many of you will be familiar. They were based on the NICE NG51 guideline. These are the only tools that are formally endorsed by NICE. And they remain current and appropriate at present. And we start with a patient who's sick. So either they look unwell to us as a health, as a health professional or they're triggering a news 2 score of five or above. And let's remind ourselves that if an inpatient in the UK has a news 2 score of five or above, they have a mortality of 14%. So it's already a sick cohort. We then qualify it with could it be due to infection? And then we move on to look for one of the red flags that we initially developed and then nice endorsed and tweaked slightly. And they were intended as an empowering set of prompts to help often junior health professionals deliver the care that they wanted to deliver and thought they probably ought to deliver at the bedside. We know that we can't measure a SOFA score at the bedside very easily, but a red flag we can identify very, very quickly. These are not meant to replace clinical judgment. Clearly, if a senior health professional thinks a patient has sepsis, but their heart rate's only 128, they can still treat a sepsis. The sepsis six changed in 2019, and I hope that many of you are aware of this because it now looks like this. And what this means is that the sort of three in three out aid memoirs are redundant. The Buffalo acronym is redundant, but we still see examples of those things. So let's try to move forward to the nice endorsed sepsis six. Get a senior clinician on the way, correct hypoxia, send a full set of bloods, including cultures, but also other strategies to risk stratify the patient, that an example might be um, uh, lactate, to help determine whether this is infective or non-infective or bacterial versus viral inflammation, and that example might be procalcitonin, and also, of course, rapid pathogen identification strategies and biomarkers like beta-D glucan, and of course, like multi-array um, multiplex pathogen identifiers. Step four is to give antibiotics, but new for 2019 was in th was think source control in there. Step six is to give fluids and step seven, sorry, step five is to give fluids and step six is to get on and monitor your patient. All of our tools have one word and it's the bottom left of your screen, variants. These tools should never replace clinical judgment. So if a health professional writes in that box, I'm withholding antibiotics, for example, because I think this might be pancreatitis, I'm waiting for a CT scan or I'm waiting for an amylase, that's sensible medicine and that should count as compliant with the pathway. Now, many of you will know that we had a commissioning incentive across England. Now, these don't exist in the devolved countries. They don't have this luxury. But in England, we can encourage hospitals to behave in a certain way by offering a sort of perverse financial incentive. And in three years, the process of care meant that we went from 32 percent of patients getting antibiotics within one hour in 2016 to 80 percent in 2019. And although it was not cause and effect, 
three sequential reports using very different methodologies, so we can't directly compare, appeared to show mortality had fallen from around 30% to around 20%. Now, I think we can imagine that one might have contributed to the other, and we can also corroborate this because New York State have pretty much identical data that they were allowed to publish in the journals. Their response rate to the bundles went from around 30% to just over 80%. Their mortality mirrored ours exactly. It went from 30% to 20%. But of course there are detractors, and I have a lot of respect for each of the authors of this paper. I'm not sure I have respect for The Lancet for publishing it, because it was slightly inflammatory and biased. But they said that sepsis only affects old people, and they said that the sepsis incentives have doubled antibiotic use. Have they? Firstly, when we're talking about antibiotics, we can't look at sepsis as fueling antimicrobial resistance. These are the diagnostic codes for severe infection, pneumonia, peritonitis, cellulitis, and urinary tract infection. And this is the number of patients admitted in 2017 to English hospitals, not UK, England, with one of those conditions staying in hospital for three or more days. So I think we can assume that this is a construct that can, that uh, includes people with severe infection. They're all going to get antibiotics. Let's not pretend they're not. It doesn't matter that they might not receive them in the first hour. They're still going to get them. So when we're talking about AMR, we need to think about the broader context of severe infection rather than just about sepsis. But it's not true that the sequin caused a doubling of antibiotic use. These are data from the Royal Pharmaceutical Society during that time period, and the authors selected a convenient period prior to the sequin so that they could give that headline that antibiotic use had doubled in emergency departments. Well, it had, but since 2014, not since 2016. But that on the face of it is alarming. But now look at the right hand column that I've highlighted. Antibiotic use across hospitals only increased by 1%. Still something that we need to monitor, but absolutely not worthy of a headline. So I would suggest that these data show that the sequin incentivized better sepsis care, definitely improving process and probably improving outcome without the adverse consequence of a total increase in antimicrobial consumption. But notwithstanding that, colleagues at the Surviving Sepsis Campaign quite rightly acknowledge that we don't have precise evidence that one hour is magic and operationalize things a little bit further in October 2021. And they said, if your patient's got shock, we're going to get on and treat within one hour. If they haven't got shock, but you're pretty sure it's sepsis, we're going to get on and treat within one hour. But if they haven't got shock and we're just a bit unsure about a diagnosis, we're going to allow a broader window of three hours. Now, I mentioned that we're transitioning. And again, many of you will have seen a statement on initial antimicrobial therapy for people with sepsis from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And you may also be aware that NICE are now revising their guideline based upon this statement. So there is an alternative to the NICE based red flag based strategy that we talked about. And it's this. And we're going to be working with the Academy to operationalize their guidance as soon as NICE announce. But for the time being, our website has two options. It's got the NICE tools and the Academy tools. We've speak, spoken to NHS Resolution, we've spoken to the CQC, and both organisations will support an organisation if they're using either one of these. If they're not using either, they just need to be able to justify it. But I would propose, and the UK SPF would propose, that we should stop using QSOFA because it's no longer recommended for use. And if we're still using SIRS, well, that's about 20 years old, and we certainly need to revise our tools in that context. So we're producing with the UK Sepsis Practitioners Forum a position statement that makes this clear, that says organisations need to decide which one they're going to use, need to stick with it for a period of time until the dust settles, and need to re-educate their staff and reinvigorate the message about sepsis in the post-COVID landscape. So what the Academy say, they chose not to look at shock as a discriminator, but to look at two inflection points of News 2. If your News 2 score is seven or above, it's a red flag, it's one hour. If it's five or six, it's an amber flag and it's three hours. There are five criteria for hospitals, four for GPs and ambulance services that can bump a patient up one threshold. So you can have someone with a news two score of three who becomes an amber flag, but not a red flag. Obviously, again, clinical judgment should trump this. So for red flag, we get on, we start the sepsis six and for amber flags, we allow a broader time period. We assess, we send bloods, we 
think within three hours about whether the patient needs antibiotics and source control. I think this is fine and fits with the evidence if it can safely be implemented, but we do have two significant concerns about this. The first is the human factors aspect, that if we say to a junior health professional, you've got an hour to give antibiotics, they get on and do it. But if we say three hours, the way patients flow through our system, it can become the next person's job and it might not be thought about until the post-take ward round. The second concern relates to diagnostics, and I'm going to finish in a little while by speaking about diagnostics. Science is developing at an astonishing rate, but our healthcare system does not integrate diagnostics well into the clinical space. I work in one of the three largest acute trusts in the country. My nurses send bloods from intensive care at six o'clock in the morning. By the time I start my ward round at about quarter to nine, nine o'clock, I can be pretty confident I won't have any bloods back because they've gone to a central laboratory. So I prob I'm almost certain I won't have any additional information at three hours than I had at one hour unless I've managed to get a CT scan or something else. So I think the impact of this is going to be limited by the way our healthcare system fails to integrate diagnostics. The other issue, of course, is we're frazzled and we have no staff. And we recently did a survey across six European countries. UK doctors' staff shortages were their biggest reason they couldn't deliver the right care to patients with sepsis, resulting in this press release. So integration of diagnostics in systems, I've said, is a problem. And let's be honest, the science is way ahead of our ability to respect the science and adopt the science. Here's an example. Here's someone with pneumonia. NICE tell us that we should give everybody with severe community acquired pneumonia, so that's high curb score or clinical judgment is severe, two antibiotics, the beta-lactam and the macrolide or the fluoroquinolone. And really the only reason we're giving that second antibiotic is in case the patient's got Legionella. Now I don't know if you know how many patients we see with Legionella every year in the UK, but it ain't many. Prior to the pandemic, we saw 460 a year on average over the three-year period leading up to the pandemic, 460. During that time, every year we admitted 1 million people with pneumonia, meaning that 999,500 people were given clarithromycin or equivalent, but did not need it. Why? Because we don't integrate the diagnostics. My lab, again in one of the three biggest trusts in the country, batches samples twice a week. So if I send a sample on a Tuesday evening, they run Legionella antigens on a Tuesday, I have to wait until Friday afternoon to get my result. My patient is needlessly getting a second antibiotic during that time. What if we could bring lateral flow tests into my diagnostic space? And if it didn't clinically look like Legionella and the lateral flow test was negative, I was empowered to not prescribe that second antibiotic. I think there's some really low hanging fruit for antimicrobial resistance. And I think we accept poor performance from our labs and just accept it as normal. Another example is in many hospitals, probably yours, if you send a blood culture on a Friday evening, it doesn't get loaded onto the incubator until Monday morning. It's an absolute travesty. If we're going to take antimicrobial resistance seriously, we need to improve the way our laboratories function and improve the way we need to integrate these diagnostics into our clinical systems. And imagine if we got this right. Imagine if we empowered non-infection specialists, non-laboratory clinicians to do the right thing with rapid diagnostics closer to the point of care, that they were integrated, that it was safe, that it was done in collaboration with infection specialists and laboratory specialists so that we were empowered to do the right thing. And that's what we call for in this white paper that we released earlier this year. Now, there are 29 individual recommendations in this. Obviously, we're not going through them, but the headline is that at a policy level, infection management needs to be considered in four pillars. We have outbreak surveillance and pandemic preparedness one, infection prevention two, the rapid treatment of time critical infection, including sepsis three, and antimicrobial stewardship four. And until governments accept that at a policy level, infections management is all part of the same problem, we're going to limit the progress we can make. This is being taken very seriously by the WHO, the European Commission, and our own government. So expect this to gain traction. So together we can save thousands of lives. It's partly through awareness and communication and clinical systems. 
But we're only going to really maximize this opportunity if we can embrace these novel technologies, as I've said, risk stratification, discriminating between infective and non-infective inflammation and pathogen identification a lot, lot better than we're doing now. Thank you very much. Excellent, Ron. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any questions for Ron, please, please type them box to the right of the screen. We'll answer as many as we can as the time allowed. OK, let's move on and let's bring in Shine Anakin. She's uh, the deteriorating patient uh, lead at Russell's Hall Hospital in the West Midlands. Good afternoon, Sean. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, just bringing the camera on as well. Um, so I'm uh, the deteriorating patient lead, but I'm also the UK Sepsis Practitioner Forum uh, communications officer as well and Ron has already mentioned the joint statement with the UK Sepsis Trust from us as well based on the new guidelines. So thinking about that in mind I would like to move on to the next slide and we would like to consider the human element of what we do with that deteriorating patient by thinking about how we bring the NICE guidelines 51 or the um, uh, statement from the AOM MRC into line and actually bring that onto the shop floor with the sepsis 6 and what challenges that actually involves. OK, next. So first of all, most places in the UK would be using the National Early Warning Score 2, which is pictured on the top there as our basis for the early warning to actually decide whether our patients are deteriorating. If this is not used within your area, I'm sure you are using uh, some kind of stratified early warning score. And the clear point of that is to bring us some kind of clue to whether our patient's deteriorating. We know from experience that 50% of um, our medical emergency calls within our trust could probably be predicted. So when we look at national guidance over the early warning scores, we can see from the Recess Council um, guidance that actually 80% of cardiac arrests can be predicted in the 12 hours leading up to that arrest. And that's based upon something like a learning warning score where you actually start to see the trend of the respiratory rate rising, the blood pressure falling and the heart rate rising or falling. And we can see that happening when we look at the big picture. Realistically, what happens in the bed space is a lot of people are maybe using computerised systems or they're just thinking about that set of OBS as something as a task to do at that particular point and not necessarily seeing that patient as a whole and thinking about what else is going on with them. So that's where early warning systems can really bring um, the deterioration into the limelight by making us think in terms of an ABCDE assessment. Clearly, it's not asking us on most of them to assess the airway. But if you're going in and saying, good morning, hello, my name's Sean, you are expecting your patient to respond back to you. And when that happens, you've assessed their airway. So you generally move straight on to thinking about their breathing. And in the majority of patients, this is the one observation that is the earliest response that shows us that they're starting to deteriorate. And yet it's usually the worst performed observation because there's no real shortcut to assessing a proper respiratory rate. Ideally, we want to spend a full 60 seconds counting that respiratory rate to actually have a good look at that patient and see whether we've got a decent rate, whether the pattern is normal, whether it's the right sort of depth for that patient, because every patient's a slightly different size, so they're going to have a slightly different lung volume. And what tends to happen is people will take shortcuts. So rather than waiting 60 seconds, they might count for 15 seconds and times by four or count for 10 seconds and times by six. And we see a very different number than if we've counted um, an unwell patient over 60 seconds. And you can have the difference between somebody counting a respiratory rate of eight and doubling it and going, ah, my patient's breathing a rate of 16 to somebody actually realising that their patient's gone apneic for a period of time in between and their pattern is very irregular and actually their entire rate is only eight. The difference in response will be one person quite happily charting 16 while the other person's reaching for a bag valve mask and is actually starting to support their patient's breathing. So breathing is near the top of the alphabet because actually recognising that as a life threatening issue can save patients lives. So it's making sure we use these early warning scores, whichever system we use to form that framework for a nice ABCD assessment. 
clearly I can use that structure whether I've got equipment around me or I can use it without equipment by just using my hands and my eyes and actually looking at my patient from that point of view. Utilising the structure gives us a trend on paper of what's actually going on with that patient because not everybody will be completely normal for um, every set of OBS beforehand and then just suddenly deteriorate. A lot of patients will be have a nice slow deterioration where we can see that trend forming like a little map of uh, peaks and troughs on our chart. And it's important that we actually start to look at that as in our clinical assessment. As life moves on to more digital things, that sort of paper view, if you like, on a graphical view can be lost and that can give us the most important bit in our trends. However, I'm sure we've all had that patient that when you've actually charted their observations down, they're not really triggering, but you know it's not the same score and it's not the same patient that you were looking after 10 minutes ago. And that's where a paper chart doesn't always give us that human element and that um, intuition. So it's important within that clinical assessment that it's not just an absolute task of getting your blood pressure and your pulse and working down that little list. It's actually looking at that patient as a whole and making it fit with that patient. When we get down to D&E, because most people are familiar with airway breathing circulation, they're not necessarily as familiar with the disability and the environment side of things and exposure. So it's thinking about the fact that actually if my patient's alert, then that's normal. But anything with a new confusion or any deterioration in conscious level is not normal. And therefore, we need to be thinking about why that patient's deteriorating. Where that becomes tricky is our patients who might exhibit soft signs. So maybe um, some of our learning disability patients or some of our patients with Alzheimer's who have a, a, a normal level of confusion. And it can be really tricky to work out whether they are actually confused and their, their conscious level has changed. And that's where speaking to the families can be the most important at this point. And actually looking out for the soft signs within these patients of other signs of deterioration. And when I think about E, I think about exposure, and that does what it says on the tin. That's looking for any other signs and symptoms of why that patient's deteriorating. And actually, they bring us into quite a few of our red flags. Look at the next slide. So when we look at the um, NICE Guidance 51, our high risk criteria does include quite a lot of our ABCDE, and that's why it links really nicely into news too. But it also has the extra signs from E with the non-blanching rash of the skin, the cyanosis, the bits that you only see when you actually walk in and you see your patient. And they're often the gut reaction. And that can be sort of thought about by asking the question, does your patient look sick? Because sometimes the numbers don't reflect what you're looking at with that patient. So they might not be scoring on an early warning score, but the trend might be starting to show and you might be starting to see that that rise or that fall, depending on the observation. So we need to be guided by a clinician in this point. And it's that person, that human in the bed space that is um, far more responsible for thinking about does that patient look sick? Are they actually deteriorating? And putting together the pieces of the jigsaw, could this be due to an infection? And if we think then, are there any red flags for sepsis, using something like News 2 is an ideal tool to help us with this, because thinking about what scores the single triggers of three leads us really nicely into the high risk criteria. So if we move to the next slide. And that when we've got any of those red flags, it's going to bring us to the sepsis six that Ron has talked about. And he's already mentioned that this changed back in 2019 to really incorporate that senior help. And for those in the UK, we now have a sequin um, based upon that senior help as well to make sure that that is happening for all patients, whether you think it's sepsis or not. Because sometimes actually it's that person with that experience who's coming, who's going, do you know what? I don't think we're treating heart failure. I think we're treating sepsis and putting in the right treatment at that point. Or in turn from that, it's actually, I don't think this is sepsis. I think this patient has heart failure and putting in the right treatment for that. And that's why we need to call on that experience and make sure that we have a doctor with that or, or somebody with antimicrobial prescribing ability who's got that experience to make that call. <laughs> 
And that's why it's been built into the sepsis six to really make sure that we get the experienced decision makers in that bed space as rapidly as possible to allow us to continue to deliver the rest within the hour. The Academy of Royal uh, Medical Royal Colleges are not disputing that the sicker patients uh, need all of this treatment within the hour, but it's just then thinking about if they've only got the amber flags, where do we go from that? Do we need to have, can we have more time to make those decisions, which we'll look at a little bit more on the next slide. So here I've put together a little bit of analysis of the two sides together because it can be really confusing if you're the person who's attending that patient, you're on the shop floor and you heard a little bit about both sides of things of actually what do I physically need to do at this point. So essentially a lot of the starting is still the same no matter which way your trust has decided to go. So I'm still going to start with that early warning score, with that A, B, C, D, E, and think about that deteriorating patient or the fact that the patient looks sick. Because someone who looks sick, even if they're not triggering, I'm going to still trigger that same sort of cat uh, catalogue of events of getting that senior review and starting to screen for sepsis. Clearly, if I've got no signs of infection, it's not going to be sepsis. I have to have my patient has to have signs of infection to be able to suspect that in the first place. So if there's no signs of infection, I'm just going to go down the route of looking for another cause of deterioration. But potentially I still need that senior review. I'm still going to optimise their oxygenation. I'm still going to optimise their cardiovascular system. And in which case I may as well continue monitoring and think about that. So when I start to think about that, I'm probably going to do everything of the sepsis six except the antimicrobials on those patients with no infection. So when I have the patients who do have signs of infection, if they've got that news of seven and above, then both sides are going exactly the same route and going, yes, we're going to deliver that sepsis six within the hour and we're going to reassess. And it is just if we're going down the route of the academy route, it's just thinking about more in terms of the medium risk criteria or the amber flags um, from the red uh, instead of the red flags and thinking about that antimicrobial decision within three hours. From my point of view, that can be really tricky. It can be falling in a shift hand over time. And then instead of knowing that before I go off duty, I'm making sure that my patient has the entire sepsis six. I might actually be handing over that decision of can you deliver the IV antibiotics before this time if that decision is made and you're having to pass on for somebody else to chase that decision. That rings alarm bells from my point of view as a, a sepsis practitioner that that can actually mean that it's somebody else's job and therefore it goes down in the list of priorities and it, it can cause further delays and we may not get those decisions within three hours. If we move on to the next slide, it's thinking about the fact that I still have that patient who's deteriorating. So regardless of what's happening, whether I'm treating them within the hour or whether I'm waiting for extra results to come back, I need to think about increasing that monitoring and considering the source control. And that's where extra diagnostics may come into place. It may be that I'm sending further samples, but certainly as Ron has alluded to, in most trusts, we're not getting um, those sorts of diagnostics back in a quick enough time to make those further decisions within the three hours. So this is where technology moving on and point of care testing and further sort of developments where you can narrow things down really quickly is really going to revolutionise that antimicrobial prescribing and sort of keeping those antimicrobials available for the future. So considering that source control in some cases might be going to theatre and actually removing that necrotic foot or sorting out the, the neck fash at that point. It may be that you're having to deliver the baby early to sort out source control from mum. So it's just thinking about in that bed space, have you actually got the monitoring that you need, but have you got the specialties do you need? So when I get down to that A, B, C, D, E, I don't just think of the E as exposure. I think of E as everything else because that is where I would encompass bringing in my sepsis six, bringing in my critical care outreach or my critical care anaesthetists involving whatever other level of monitoring I need because it's quite likely if this patient is on a ward that I am going to have to facilitate movement to somewhere with a higher level of monitoring. So 
that's the thing that I want to think about at that point is where else I can go, what else I can bring in and how I can keep this patient safe. Next slide. And the key from all of that is that the early recognition of deterioration saves lives. So if we can bring all of that back to that ABCDE and using those screening tools, whichever side that you choose to go down, whether it be with the NICE guidance as it is now or with the Academy's ruling, then actually they all come down to the fact that we have a patient at the end of that and we're trying to actually put that early treatment in and actually save lives that time because time can be skin time could be limbs and it's certainly critical to the patient at that point. Thank you. Excellent Sean, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, don't, don't forget some, if you have any questions for Sean or indeed for Ron, uh, anything you've thought about since Ron was on then by all means type them into the chat box. We'll also have a Q&A session for about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar. Well, we should have had uh, Sandy Estrada joining us, but unfortunately uh, she's stuck in Hurricane Ravage, Florida. Uh, it doesn't look as though she's managed to get through to connect. So we've got a very able deputy in Oscar Guzman. Um, Oscar, that's all about know about you. I only know your name. Perhaps you could introduce yourself and do your presentation for us. Thanks for joining us. Of course, uh, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Oscar Guzman. I'm also a clinical pharmacist in the U.S. Uh, and my specialty is in critical care, infectious disease, and antibiotic stewardship. So I'm very excited to uh, talk to you today, unfortunately, um, in, in place of Sandy, hope, hoping that everything's okay there. So um, today I'll be talking about improving clinical outcomes and the power of new rapid diagnostics. Next slide. So I want to start off today uh, giving you a sepsis case study. Um, take here, for example, a 73-year-old man with a history of ulcerative colitis who presents to the hospital complaining of severe abdominal pain, lightheadedness, and bloody stools. The patient is admitted to the surgical intensive care unit for hemodynamic instability and planned emergency abdominal surgery. The patient subsequently undergoes major abdominal surgery and receives four days of broad spectrum antibiotics for intra-abdominal infection. Hospital day eight, the patient um, was stable until sepsis is suspected. Now here we've put in some examples of some sepsis criteria. It looks like it's SERS criteria, but this could be any sort of uh, um, uh, patient selection criteria or, or you know, news, muse, whatever you're using in your hospital. Blood cultures are ordered, patient restarted on empiric antibiotic spectrums to cover suspected intra-abdominal infection recurrence as well as fluconazole being added for potential fungal pathogens. Next slide. Hospital day nine, the patient is still, uh, the, the sepsis is still unresolving, and now the patient is requiring vasopressors. As you can see, some of the vital signs show deterioration. The patient still has a fever, blood pressure still low, increasing heart rate, increasing respiratory rate. Blood cultures thus far have not turned positive. So if we're doing the math a little bit, we're looking at 24 plus hours so far. CT scan shows free air and fluid collections and the patient returns to the operating room. At this point, we think, for, we think to ourselves, what further labs can be ordered to evaluate this patient for sepsis? And that's gonna be the subject of today's presentation. Next slide. So we want to think about this, and I think it's already been mentioned uh, significantly how appropriate it is to get the right therapy to the patient, to get the appropriate diagnosis. Uh, we know that time to appropriate therapy is a key driver for clinical outcomes. We know that um, extended time from presentation to getting the patient on the right therapy is a major contributor for poor patient outcomes, and uh, as well as proliferation of antimicrobial resistance. The current standard of care, as we've discussed already, requires you know, up to three days, sometimes five days to provide species ID and susceptibilities. Why is this important? Because we know that for every hour delay in time to appropriate therapy, uh, survival decreases by 7.6% uh, during septic shock. And we know that as many as 80% of sepsis deaths could be prevented with rapid diagnosis and treatment. And we also know that prolonged use of antimicrobials, especially broad spectrum antimicrobials, is a known risk factor associated with the development and spread of antimicrobial resistant organisms. Next slide, please. We also know that current blood culture diagnostics in sepsis patients can also lead to overprescribing of antibiotics. Um, 
we, we tend to think that sometimes overdiagnosis becomes acceptable because it's a better outcome versus, uh, it, it, because overtreating is less harmful than missing the septic patient. So sometimes we accept those consequences, but should we? Um, has This has been mentioned already, but we know that there are consequences associated with overprescribing, including hospital acquired infections like Clostridium difficile, uh, toxicity associated with these uh, uh, therapies, and from the pharmacist's perspective, this is something that we're you know, currently monitoring. We're always looking at this, as well as antimicrobial resistance. We want to make sure that these drugs work in the future. Next slide. So what is the current uh, laboratory blood culture standard of care? So we can see here in the middle, uh, we're getting our blood cultures, and it's usually one to five days before we start to get a gram stain, before we get a pathogen ID, or before we then uh, um, uh, put the cultures into a MALDI or any other uh, rapid diagnostic technology. So um, at the same time, you can see on the bottom, empiric therapy is kind of following along with that same time period. We're not really able to make any decisions, any changes until we start to get information on what the species is, what's the susceptibility. Next slide. <clears throat> What are the diagnostic challenges with blood cultures? We know that those aren't perfect. Uh, we know that ideally, uh, surviving sepsis campaign has a one hour bundle to obtain blood cultures before starting empiric antimicrobial therapy in patients with suspected sepsis or septic shock. And that is if doing so uh, does not lead to a delay in uh, the start of antimicrobials. What's the dilemma? We know that only five to 13% of blood cultures actually show positive growth. We also have to deal with the potential for contamination and are we gonna treat this? Um, we also know that you know, in trying to get uh, the antimicrobial to the patient as fast as possible, um, in some cases, we may not be able to get that blood culture. We also know that single doses of antibiotics administered zero to four hours prior to specimen collection can actually sterilize blood culture. So then that kind of changes how we're going to respond to these um, therapies. And then lastly, we know that there are sometimes issues with sample collection. Uh, sometimes it's an access issue. Sometimes it's a volume issue. Um, and that's, of course, also going to affect our results. Next slide. Um, I talked a little bit about antimicrobial exposure, reducing blood culture sensitivity. This was a study done in 2019, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. They looked at 325 patients, um, and you can see here that as time progressed, um, the sensitivity of, of post blood cultures decreased. Blood cultures were repeated in all subjects, but only 19.4% actually turned positive. So we do know that this is a big issue that you know we have concern with. Um, you know, in, in balancing the act of getting those blood cultures and starting those antimicrobials early. Next slide. Why are mu multiple blood culture sets needed? Um, this is an, an older study, but it, but it does demonstrate that in some cases, getting one set or two set of blood cultures may not be enough. Um, this study looked at different species. You can see here gram positive and gram negative species. Um, the percent cumulative detected by culture number. And we can see that with only one set of blood cultures, only between 80 to 90% of the blood cultures were showing positivity. And it took up to four blood cultures um, to obtain single pathogen detection. Next slide. We heard this mentioned already as well, culture negative sepsis. This is the presence of clinical signs and symptoms that are highly suggestive of sepsis despite lack of pathogen growth and identification from obtained cultures. We know that there's various possible uh, causes for this. And as I just mentioned, um, antibiotic exposure prior to culture collection, viral illness perhaps, the presence of atypical pathogens that are not easily cultured. So we may be waiting a longer period of time as well as a misdiagnosis uh, of a non-infectious process. 28 to 90 percent of sepsis patients have never had a pathogen identification by culture, uh, and in a study of 1,000 patients with severe sepsis, culture positivity was not independently associated with mortality. Next slide, please. So can we do better? We've heard a lot of conversations about integrating rapid diagnostics into our diagnostic process and how are we managing septics patients. Um, so could we incorporate non-culture dependent diagnostics? So at the time that we identify sepsis, is there a possibility to run further tests and potentially obtain species ID within three to five hours during that time 
or is there an ability to know whether or not this is a bacterial process or a non-bacterial process, a viral process, uh, and so forth? Do we have the technology to be able to get this type of information? Next slide. So this leads us to the conversation of non-culture-based rapid diagnostics for uh, bloodstream infections. Culture-based, as you know, are dependent on blood culture positivity. We have to wait until those turn positive in order to um, get your culture. Um, they are impacted by the presence of antibiotics, as, as we have just shown, and may include resistance markers. So um, the, advan that the examples would be filmarray, PCR, MALDI, TOF, um, and so on, showing phenotypic and genotypic, genotypic resistance markers. We also have the ability to now look at non-culture based. These are dependent on patient selection algorithms, so we're going to have to be very selective about who's meeting the criteria as we're doing for sepsis, very similar. Um, and this also provides the opportunity to rapidly escalate or could provide the opportunity to rapidly escalate or de-escalate antibiotic therapy. In some cases, resistance markers may not be provided, although some of these new technologies do have resistance markers. Examples include next generation sequencing, procalcitonin, and T2 MR based identification. Next slide. I mentioned those already, procalcitonin. Um, if you haven't heard of this already, this is a biomarker to help differentiate bacterial from viral infections and supports early diagnosis of sepsis. It requires 200 microliters of plasma or serum. Um, it has a, about a 20 minute turnaround time if it's done in house. Um, however, as you know, it does not provide species identification. Uh, T2 magnetic resonance, or MR, uh, provides direct detection from four mLs of whole blood. It detects six species commonly causing sepsis. Uh, it's six species approved in, in, in Europe, including E. faecium staph aureus, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Acinetobacter baumani. The turnaround time is three to five hours. The sensitivity and specificity is 90 and 98%. Um, and we do know that, you know, depending on the hospital epidemiology um, and on the studies that we have seen so far, um, T2MR is able to detect 50 to 70% of all sepsis uh, cases um, that are being identified uh, in the studies. And then the other uh, option are next generation sequencing of microbial cell free DNA. This requires uh, 5 mLs of blood. Um, in the US, th these are not FDA cleared. Um, the turnaround time is 80, greater than 85%, um, usually within a day, so about 24 hours, because these are sent out. Um, that can detect uh, more than 1,000 bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. And the sensitivity ranges, uh, sensitivity and specificity range anywhere between uh, 93 over 59 percent. Next slide. So I'll give you a little bit more information about the T2DX instrument workflow that uses the T2MR technology. This includes T2 bacteria, T2 candida, and T2 resistance, different panels that you can see there on the screen. Um, this works uh, by uh, uh, obtaining the blood sample, uh, usually a 4 ml vacutainer. The sample actually only uses 2 ml. It then undergoes blood cell lysis and concentration in a matter of minutes, um, lysis of those pathogen cells, amplification within two hours, hybridization with nanoparticles that can then be detected using the T2 magnetic resonance technology. Um, this methodology enables um, in inhibition-free DNA amplification in complex clinical matrices. In the US and Europe, it's currently only approved um, for blood, but there have been some studies looking at other samples. Um, the advantage is that there is no background interference with human DNA or antibiotics, and it really simplifies the process and eliminates extraction and purification of targets. Um, and then T2 magnetic resonance enables measurement direct from the patient sample and enables a higher sensitivity. As you can see here, the, the current panels for T2 bacteria include the six uh, bacterial species. We do know that sometimes in some cases, depending on the patient's risk factors, we do have to worry about um, fungal infections. So there is a panel that does have um, five candida species. And there is a new panel um, with resistance markers um, looking at both gram-negative and gram-positive resistance markers. Next slide. 
Um, there are a couple of case studies um, that uh, I'd like to go over. We have time. This is a case study of anti-pseudomonal de-escalation. Uh, and this is an example of how T2 bacteria result was used interventionally to direct therapy. The patient receiving dialysis became unresponsive and developed sepsis. The patient was started on broad spectrum antibiotics, including vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam, which are pretty standard here in the US as broad spectrum antimicrobials for gram, gram positive and gram negative pathogens with, when patients have an MRSA risk as well as a pseudomonas risc. The T2 bacteria rapid uh, Staph aureus result led to a de-escalation of gram-negative therapy. So quickly they were able to de-escalate from the piperacillin and tazobactam. Uh, blood cultures later confirmed the Staph aureus result, the bacterial infection cleared and the patient was discharged. Next slide, please. Um, I think there are several case studies that we can go over, but we can go to the next study and leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. One more slide. Um, one more slide, please. All right, so the last thing I want to go over is uh, this uh, meta-analysis of 14 studies. Here they looked at antimicrobial resource utilization using T2 magnetic resonance for rapid di diagnostics and in bloodstream infections. Um, they evaluated antimicrobial and resource utilization using this technology in blood culture in patients with uh, suspected BSIs. We can see here a summary of some of the results. Time to detection and species identification was three times faster with T2. For patients, this is important when we think about the antimicrobial therapy. For patients testing positive on T2, they received targeted antimicrobial therapy 42 hours faster. That means we know what the patient, uh, what species the patient uh, is growing or what, what the infection is. So we're able to get that therapy faster. For patients that had negative testing, meaning that pathogen was not identified in blood culture, they were able to de-escalate from empirical therapy seven hours faster. Um, the length of ICU stay was five days shorter with T2. The length of hospital stay was about 4.8 days shorter with T2. And mortality rates were comparable. So um, all in all, we'll, we're looking at um, quicker identification of the pathogens and getting the patient on the right therapy, which is so crucial, as we have learned from our previous speakers. Next slide, please. Thank you. That's it um, uh, for today, and I'm happy to answer any questions along with the other panel members. Excellent, Oscar. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks once again for stepping in at the last minute. A great uh, presentation. If we can bring uh, the speakers back into the rooms, oh, and you can see there we've got Ron and we've got Sean. Um, one that came up uh, about 25 past one, and I think it's Ron and, and Sean. Uh, Ron first, do you advocate paper or electronic news too? Yeah, that that's a really good question, and there would be people here that, that automatically would say, well, we, we've got to have this electronic. There's actually, if you look at the data, particularly in pediatrics, but also in adults, there's no demonstrable outcome benefit prior, uh, sorry, post the introduction of electronic decision support tools. I think theoretically they offer huge benefit. Um, it's around um, redundancy. It's around reducing transcription error in transcribing um, observations onto, onto pieces of paper. But what's really important with both systems is actually the reliability of the observations and the reliability of the escalation. And if those bits aren't done properly, then the electronic system won't change anything. John? Um, I agree. We've certainly gone from paper to electronic and we have some benefits from being electronic, as in people can now add up because the computer does that for you. And it will give us some alerts for um, actually triggering for things like that. But even though we have an electronic graph built into the system, people don't necessarily look at it. Whereas when you work on the paper charts, the graph is right there in front of you and those trends jump out at you as you fill that paperwork in. So there are very much advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, clearly paper is cheaper, but it, it depends on what your trust will use, but there are very much advantages to both. Uh, Paul, if That's I may. Any thoughts I, on that? Could, sorry, sorry, go on, Dan. No, sorry. Yeah, carry on with Oscar Oscar's thoughts on this, but I, I think we really need to pick up Lewis's point on news yeah. too. Yeah, I'll just give you a quick perspective from what we're seeing here in the US. A lot of hospitals, the majority have gone to electronic charting. 
And I will tell you, uh, some of the challenges are burnout. We're getting so many alerts, so many uh, pieces of information coming to the nurses, the pharmacists, and the physicians that there's something called burnout. It's just information overload. And the other thing is um, uh, just not, you know, if the result is there, not responding to it. So, so sometimes we have the alerts coming out, but if you're not going to react to it or if the staff are not available to react to it, then what's the point? So we have to manage those things as well. Yeah, totally agree well, with Oscar's point around alert fatigue. It's a huge issue. Yeah, so let's move on to the question that you was going to look at then, uh, Ron, with Prim Lewis. Um, what about for renal nephrology, uh, especially for medical patients who have chronically high blood pressure? How do we adjust the two score to suit specific needs of a particular group of patients? And it's referring to um, obviously um, the news two and the ES, uh, sorry, ESRD CKD patients. Yeah, I mean, Sean will be the expert here, but I think this is such an important question. I've just got two points on that. Firstly, news two should not replace clinical judgment. So if you think your patient's sick, you act whatever the news two score says. Um, it's, a re it's a redundancy, it's a decision support tool. The second point is that a lot of people in NHS England sort of evangelise over News 2, and indeed it is the most validated scoring system that we have, but it will improve over time and it needs to be customisable because it's illogical to apply the same thresholds to an 18-year-old athlete and an 88-year-old with cardiorespiratory disease. And I think as we get bigger data and as we apply intelligence to those data, we'll have different News 2s for, or News 5s or whatever to different populations. Yeah, certainly working on that principle, News 3 is being worked upon as we speak. And one of the things that they're looking at in big style in that is individualising the news. And that can be far easier to do on your electronic systems than on your paper systems, potentially, because you can um, get it so that you still have the actual News 2 score, but you can change the alerting system for that individual patient. And that has to be the way to go because not everybody is the same and what fits for one patient doesn't fit for the other. It's not just your renal patients, your respiratory patients and COVID has taught us an awful lot about that. And that's why we've gone from news to news two in the first place, looking at the fact that one size doesn't fit all. So it is an evolving process. And, and unfortunately, that's where actually we found electronic systems are, have worked better for us than paper ones to actually individualise that score and bring in treatment and escalation plans as well. Because just because we can treat people doesn't mean that we should treat everybody. And that's a different ball game altogether. Oscar. I agree with the previous panel members. There's a final question because we are rapidly running out of time. There's one from um, Nicola Tipping. Uh, it says here, uh, how do pe people find using the paediatric uh, version? Many under fives can score so high for a variety of reasons. Not all are sepsis. Could we so, ask Nicola whether she means the version of the sepsis screening tool or the version of uh, or, or, or paediatric early warning scores? Right, let's see if she'll, she puts that up. Um, but yeah, it's it doesn't actually say it on there, as you no. can see. But um, I mean, from the perspective of the sepsis screening tools. In a second. Yeah, from the perspective of the sepsis screening tools, they are intentionally slightly more sensitive than the adult tools. And that was a conscious decision that we made with NICE uh, a number of years ago. I think most health professionals would rather um, see a few well kids than miss one sick kid. Um, but what we actually find if you look at the data is it's the 5 to 11 tool that over triggers more. And I think as the national pews becomes more adopted, then we'll have a more standardised approach and those tools will eventually become redundant. Yeah. And I think I th certainly think the national pews is going to make a huge difference because certainly within the West Midlands um, a few years ago, we had that many different scoring systems for paediatrics that the first thing we did as, as a region was we actually started to speak to our, our main centre and go, well, how do you score your patients? Because then we start to talk the same language. And that makes a huge, huge difference because from my point of view, our early warning score for paediatrics was scored from one to four and we were sending to a hospital that scored from one to 24. So all of a sudden we were really worried about somebody scoring a three and they would go, oh, they can go home. So 
bringing in the national score is the first step in actually solving this problem at that point because we all start to talk that same language and that's got to help not just for sepsis but for all deteriorating patients for paediatric wise. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. As you can see from all the comments coming up in the chat box there, uh, a very well received webinar from, from all you guys. So many thanks to Ron, Sean and Oscar for his last minute excellent presentation. Hopefully you guys have taken something uh, from the session as well. Uh, any questions that we haven't managed to answer, we will uh, get them answered for you via email. And if you'd like to watch the webinar again at your leisure, then it will be available uh, on morning all you've got to do is go to www.nolex.co.uk and click on there and uh, just let you know that uh, we will have another webinar coming up soon so keep an eye out for that but on behalf of everybody at nolex and on behalf of ron and sean thank you very much indeed for joining us guys i know you're very very busy and uh, thanks for the time very informative and we'll speak to you again soon thank you